Well, welcome everyone. This is Deborah Darris, and I am so super excited to have you here today to talk about the five mistakes new public speakers make, often make, not always, and how to avoid them. And today is going to be a very informational, educational, and my intention is also transformational webinar because the more you master the art of public speaking the better you're going to be able to be that messenger for a very important message and before i even get started with the content i just want to let you know why i am so passionate about sharing with you about public speaking you see i never thought I would be a public speaker. In fact, when I was seven years old, my friends and I used to play games. And at my generation, we played imaginary games. And the game we often played was school. And guess what I played? The teacher. And my neighbors were all of the students and I'd be on the whiteboard and I'd be showing them bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Who knows what I was even talking about, but my passion was always to teach. That was until February 16th, 1992, when a sudden course correction in my life put me on a different trajectory where I became a speaker. And normally I would go into the story of it, but because I have so much content I wanna cover, I will skip to the punchline and share with you that that was the day that my 16 year old brother transitioned, ascended became my angel and he had an epileptic seizure. We had spent the entire weekend of Valentine's Day today together, which we normally don't do. I would spend it with a boyfriend or with a significant other. But this year in 1992, I spent that weekend with my brother and it was the last weekend that my brother was alive. And after my brother passed away, everyone would say, what a tragedy. I'm so sorry that you lost your brother. And the more they said that, the more I felt horrible. I felt awful. I felt devastated. How could such a beautiful boy, 16 years old, full of unconditional love with a developmental disability be taken from this earth? It just didn't seem fair. And, you know, I was seriously considering not even continuing living here on this earth. I just didn't want to be a part of a world without my brother. And I was so devastated. And I remember going to sleep one night and I had this dream. And I don't know if you've ever had a dream, but it's like so real. It's almost like you're in a parallel reality or it's like actually happening like a lucid dream. And my brother came during this dream and he said, oh no, it wasn't a tragedy that I passed away. This was my destiny and you have a destiny and you're here to speak. I was like, speak? What are you talking about? I'm a teacher. I taught preschool, I taught college, I taught workshops, I did corporate training. He's like, no, you are here to speak. And he was so certain about it. And I was 19 at that time. And I was like, what the heck am I gonna speak about? But when I woke up the next day, instead of feeling, that dread, like I didn't want to live on this planet anymore. I felt inspired. I really believe that we all have a soul's contract after that day, that we are here because we have a specific mission, that we have a movement, that we have a message, and that it is our full-time job to get our ego, not our amigo, out of our way and go full out full stream ahead with our message. And that's what my brother's dream taught me. And that's what we are here to do today. We're not just here to go over content and give you some bullet points. We're here because you have a why. You have a very important vision, a purpose that you are passionate about, that you were given just like this little divine download, this little inner wisdom, this little nudge that says, okay, Jade, it's your time to take the stage. Okay, Bonnie, I know that you have something to say. 
all right, Melinda, it's your time. And during this presentation, I'm going to share with you some of the mistakes that many public speakers make and that I myself have made and how to overcome them so that you can really align with your goals and dreams, but more importantly, your soul's contract, the reason why you came here. So for those of you that don't know me, which most of you do, um, it's so nice to have Bonnie, my former student on here, who came and called me the other day, made my, not just my day, not just my week, I think you made my year with telling me that you remembered something that I had said in the classroom, um, because I could speak at Netflix, I could speak at Verizon, but the impact that you have on people's lives go beyond any corporate boardroom. And so partial list of my clients are many, almost every Fortune 100 company that you can think of. And my next candidate is Meta that I'm working on coming up, but General Electric, JP Morgan, Procter & Gamble was a keynote speaker at their conference, Macy's, NASA, Caltech, spoken to rocket scientists, spoken to judges, I've spoken to police officers, I've spoken to sheriff's department, all of the military. I've trained US Air Force, Marines, Navy, except the Army. Uh, and I had the honor of training also people that were recovering from addictions, teenagers in recovery, rival gang members, prison. Oh, that was one of my, I think my most fun thing I ever did was going into this jail wasn't prison it was a jail and I remember they told me when I got there two things you cannot do Deborah you cannot smile and you cannot overly engage I was like you got the wrong speaker people because <laughs> I was teaching um marketing as soon as I start talking about marketing I'm gonna smile so anyway it was awesome and countless association groups women's group Latina groups college and universities I can't even count all of the places in the last 22 years that I've spoken for. But one thing that I can tell you is it doesn't matter what the group is, what it matters is your intention. And your intention in understanding that each and every person that's sitting in the chair has the same hopes and dreams that you do. They have the same desires to belong, the same desires for safety, for protection. They have the same intentions for wanting to do better by their family. And no one is better than another person. We're all human beings having experience, learning from our life school. And when we realize that, when we're presenting, they're not better than us and we're not better than them. We are facilitators. And what we're doing is we're not telling them what to do. We're evoking, we're igniting a fire within our audience members so that they can either learn something, be inspired by something, be persuaded by something. It's perfect that tonight is, you know, the Democratic National Convention, whether you're Democratic, Republican, or neutral, it doesn't matter. What are each speaker? It's, it's a conference with speakers. And what is each speaker doing? They're influencing, informing, imparting, inspiring an action to be taken, right? They want a vote, right? A certain direction. And every single time we take that microphone, we open our mouth, we are evoking something in the individuals that we're looking at. And the more we can get out of our own way and be an unencumbered messenger, a clear vessel for the information to pour through us, not from us, the more it's gonna be graceful. I like to think of speaking like a dance. When you are dancing and you are counting steps, you're like one, two, three, right? It can be kind of robotic. But when you are feeling the music and you are just allowing it to come through you, it flows. And that's what my intention is to have your speaking flow, right? So we're going to go through some of the little, I have five tips that I'm going to go over that is really, really going to help you. 
And I'm just going to get into it. And we're going to go full speed ahead. And then at the end, I'm going to take some time to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, cool. So the first one, when it comes to preparing for speeches, I cannot tell you how many times I would be in hotel rooms in their lobbies, sitting next to their printer, because I would be writing and rewriting my speech over and over. I'd be a keynote speaker at a huge conference. I remember the parents as teacher national conference, and I had the same limo driver as Stedman Graham. And you know who Stedman Graham is. He's Oprah's boyfriend, right? So I definitely wanted to connect with him so I could get to Oprah, right? But instead of getting a good night's sleep and resting up so I could be focused and refreshed and ready to network with Stedman Graham, my fellow keynote speaker, I was sleepless in Seattle, not Seattle, I think, I don't know where it was, to be honest. Once you get on the road, if you become a booked paid speaker, you don't know where you are, <laughs> you're just all over the place. Wherever I was, I was writing and rewriting my speech. I was looking at the piece of paper of my speech and I was reading it left to right, left to right, left to right. And what was wrong with that? I, I got on stage the next day and I was wearing a big, I still remember my outfit, this hot pink suit. And if you go to my website, DebraDaris.com, you'll see a clip of the video when I was on that stage and I was acting out my confessions of an adrenaline addict speech and acting like a superwoman that tries to do it all. But I did not say anything that was written down maybe one or two lines, everything else came from the flow. Why? Because our brain, if you know anything about neuroscience, our brain has different functions, right? And when we are preparing to speak, what do you think would be the best way to prepare? Is it visually, auditorily, or kinesthetically? Actually, it's all three. That was a trick question, right? Because we need to see it so that part of our cerebral cortex can, you know, have a little deposit of it. We need to say it so that we can hear ourselves speaking it out loud. Why? It's muscle memory, right? So if we get nervous because there's lights on us or there's a certain person in the audience that you might have a certain feeling about or just whatever, you just had an off day, whatever might throw you off, when you're saying it out loud, it gets it into your body, into your cells of your body. And then kinesthetically, what does kinesthetically mean? You're actually performing your speech. I was on a lot of different dance teams from hip hop to cheerleading to salsa to samba. Anytime we would rehearse, they would say, don't just mark the steps, go full out like it's an actual performance. And so we'd be like, ah, you know, we'd like put it all in and have the eye contact and have the body language and have the feeling of the dance, right? Kinesthetically getting it in our body. When you are a master orator, and I really recommend that after where you're done tonight that whether you want to watch it or not that you watch if you don't want to watch the democratic and national convention then watch on youtube the replay of the republican national convention but watch and listen for the oration what is the difference between a speaker and an orator a speaker says the words and communicates to the audience the orator is almost like a poet the way that the, the cadence of the words, the rhythm of the words. And you don't have to be a perfect speaker, but when you say your speech out loud, you feel it. You get it in, into not just your mind, not just your body, but your soul, baby. You're able to really, really connect with the meaning behind the words because the words 
are powerful, but if you're just rote, repeating them or iterating them, it's not going to have the same impact. So now what I recommend my coaching clients do, and it's really easy. Oh, I moved my tripod. I have, I have what's called a, a Osmo, and I'll email all of you the Amazon link for that. And what it does, it is a tripod, but it's AI activated. So it follows my eye pattern. So when I'm speaking, in rehearsal or on stage, because I'm always going to recommend that you record, video record every single one of your presentations. Why are you going to do that? Because when you do that, you're going to be able to really see, hear, and see, and, and mark how you're pacing how things are going, right? So you could use that AI generated one or something like this, which is a very simple tool. And it even comes with portable lighting. I have my portable lighting up, but you can have portable lighting. And the more you look at yourself and watch yourself on video, the more you're going to be able to notice little things that you do that you say, but what I want you to do is not analyze yourself from a place of judgment because some of you, and, and I know you, all of you, you are perfectionists, right? And you expect a whole lot of yourself. So your challenge isn't going to be doing better. Your challenge is going to be not being so critical you will do better. Every time that you look at one of your videos, you're going to say like me playing with my hair, right? I would play with my hair. Or when I was on stage standing behind the podium, we're going to talk about that in a moment, right? But it's so important to practice out loud. It's so important to video record. And it's even more important. Now, here's something that I haven't done a lot, but I'm going to recommend it for you because it's going to take you to the next level. I didn't have to do it because I was as a professor, as a corporate trainer in front of audiences four out of five days a week. But for you, if you're not in front of a lot of people all the time, I want you to practice your speech in front of maybe two people could be a significant other, a son, a daughter, a family member, not a dog. <laughs> My dog looks at me, as you can tell, he's a little bit barky. Sorry about that. He'll look at me like, mommy, why? Why you talk like that? <laughs> he's like, I, I do sometimes sometimes he's a he's a, he becomes my audience member when i'm just practicing in front of a mirror but i want you to look at people why because when you practice looking at people you will stay focused and stay connected and not be distracted by distractions right you're also going to notice little nuances that people have let me tell you something. I had this guy in the audience. I'll never forget. I was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he was literally staring at me like this. I even know his name, TJ. And he looked at me and the whole time he was like, and I was thinking in the back of my mind, because my ego is not my amigo, this guy hates me. He does not like what I'm talking about. He is thinking I am imposter syndrome, right? Back when I had it, he was thinking that I'm not, I don't know what I'm talking about. And when I get out to do the book signing, because they allowed me to have a book signing, we can talk about organizing your book signing at another webinar, but it's very important that you pre-sign your books. Let me just tell you that. So anyway, we're having the book signing and the gentleman that was like this comes up to me and he's like, Deborah, I just loved your presentation. I was like, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, really? I wouldn't think so by the way you're like that. But that was just the way he was processing. Some people, when they process information, look angry. They're like this, because maybe you're making them think. And when they think, they might have an ugly face <laughs> or an irritated, perceive the perception that the face is irritated. 
but it's really not. So that's why I highly encourage you practice in front of people so that you're number one, get used to being in front of a group and all the distractions of lights and camera and action, but also you can hear yourself in your head and stay present in your body. And that's an art that takes practice. Third, so you can see audience reactions and adjust yourself. What happens if you say something and they laugh? Or what happens if you say something and it needs a pause? I'll give you an example. I have a book, it's called Confessions of an Adrenaline Addict, How to Achieve More with Less Effort. And I would often start my keynote speeches with, I have a confession to make. Pause, pause, pause. Can I confide in you? And then I would lean in, <laughs> like with the audience. I am an adrenaline addict. I know what you're thinking. No, no, not bungee jumping, not skydiving. No, what I'm talking, and then I would pause. Do you see where I'm doing pauses? But that took practicing in front of the audience. So I would know certain places where to pause. And I was speaking as if I was having a conversation with that one person. I would say, I know what you're thinking. And I would point. You think I'm talking about bungee jumping or skydiving or extreme sports when I say adrenaline. But actually, when I say adrenaline, I was addicted to stress. I was a human doing, not a human do being. I was go, 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 do, do, do. And I would never take a break until one day I was walking and I looked and my hair was falling out in clumps. I had hives all over my back because of the excessive diet coke I was consuming just to keep up the pace. And I was completely exhausted. And people would say, how do you do all that you do in a day? And my ego would be like, I just get it done. But little did they know I was dying inside. Do you see the difference? So, I, I mean, do you see what I'm talking about when when you're when you're orating rather than speaking? So right now I'm speaking to you. I'm facilitating. I'm teaching. I'm guiding. But when we give a speech, do you see how it's a different energy? The oration is you are bringing them into the story. You are bringing them into your world and you are giving the image like you're having a conversation just with them by the way you're presenting. I actually learned this. Don't laugh at me. Don't judge. But once Oprah went off the air, and by the way, Oprah was my mentor. We would meet every day at 3 o'clock p.m. for 30 years, and she would give me all these tips. She's like, listen, once you hit menopause, you got to get the bioidentical. No, I'm kidding. She taught me everything I knew about everything. But then when she went off the air, I had to go to Wendy Williams. Right? I didn't go to her for life advice, but I went to her for pop culture. And if you know anything about Wendy Williams, if you've never watched her YouTube Wendy Williams TV show, she would be so hilarious because she would be so authentic, so authentically her. And she'd be like, I got to tell you something. Let me come into the camera. Don't tell anybody. But, you know, and then she talked to you like that. So I started incorporating that into my presentation, into my speeches. And at the end, when I'd be doing the book signing or whatever we would have at the back of the room, people would say, I felt like you were talking just to me because Oprah taught me that the key to connecting with a million people when she would be on TV isn't to think that you're connecting to a million people, but to think that you're solving the pain and problem for that one person. So then everyone feels special. Ooh la la, Oprah's good. Let's drop the mic on Oprah. Okay, I can go on and on about all I learned from Oprah. All right, so we're good with that, right? We're not just going to practice and write out the speech and rewrite out the speech and look at this speech. By the way, let me go back one second. Can I give you one more tip on this? Because you are going to be better than I ever was. You are going to, what took me 10, 15 years to learn, 
you're not going to have that. Why? Because you are going to start at the top. How? You're going to practice. I highly recommend joining a Toastmasters group. Some of you have already said this too. You go to toastmasters.org. It's so convenient because they have them online. And if you're a business owner like me, small business owner, it's a wonderful opportunity to strategically align your brand with an audience that you want to speak at. My first paid speaking engagement came from the audience of my Toastmasters meeting. Like if you're a lawyer, you could be around uh, an audience of people that you would want to target, maybe creatives that need intellectual property law. You could do Toastmasters speeches for that. And then every speech can be around your business. And then it's like getting marketing for free. Ooh la la, that's a great tip. Okay, had to go back for that great tip. All right, next. When we talk about speaking, okay, one of the things that I teach when I do public speaking training is we want to make sure that we shift from I to you or we. So I'm giving you stories right now and I'm sharing stories from my own life, putting you in the story, right? So I'm giving you stories so you can think of, oh, when I'm on that stage doing a keynote or when I am, so I'm strategically picking stories where I can imagine you putting yourself in my place, you doing your book signing, you standing on stage, having that microphone. You don't want to do stories about you just for ego, just for aggrandizement. You want to do stories that are going to help your audience put themselves in that scene. And if you do do a story about yourself, at the end, what was I doing? I was bringing it back to you. And that's why when you practice, and that's why when you do this, right? One of the things that I do when I speak is as much as possible, I will use you or we language. I use a lot of we inclusivity because for a long time, I had a business partner. Her name was Adelaide O'Dunt, and we wrote the Confessions book together, and we would do our time expansion workshops together. So part of why I say we is because she's always with me in spirit. God bless her soul. She passed away in her 60s, and, you know, part of the adrenaline addiction really took havoc on her body. So that's why I'm so passionate about teaching how to overcome overwhelm and burnout and success with ease and grace because of that. But her legacy lives on through me, right? So we wanna make sure that when we are speaking and telling a story, that this story is related to something that the topic is about, that the audience can buy into. How do you know what the audience will buy into. One of the things that I do is I have a pre-event questionnaire before I speak. I'm going to be speaking to a national Latina leadership organization coming up to their board. And the board is having a lot of problems with communication. But I need to know exactly what those problems are. Because as professional speakers, or as powerful public speakers, what we're doing is we're solving the pain and problem of our audience member with our topic. Our topic is the solution to their pain or problem. So what is going to help you be the hero in their story? It's knowing what their pain and problem is, right? So what do I do to set myself up for success? What are you gonna do to set yourself up for success? a pre-event questionnaire. And so I've developed one and every, I've been using pretty much the same one for 20 years. And so before I go, I know the demographics of the audience. I know the core values of the audience. I know the mission, the vision. I know the culture. I know the three deliverables that they want people to take away. And I don't just ask them, how, what points do you want? But I ask them, how do you want them to feel? because sometimes language gets lost in translation, I make sure I understand the audience. And if, if it's a big, big gig and they're paying big, big bucks and it's for a big corporate thing, they will also 
give me three people that I can call to do research so I can actually speak to someone within the organization and find out what maybe the human resource manager that hired me didn't tell me. And then I'll be able to go even deeper to understand, you know, this is what it says on paper, but this is really what's going on in our corporate culture. So when I'm doing the stories during the speech, it will really feel relevant and apropos to the people in the audience. The other thing that we want to have to really make a difference is to make sure that in our speech, we have calls to actions. Why do we have calls to action? Because otherwise, it's just information. And what happens with information with most people, especially nowadays, and especially younger people, is we're overloaded with information. We have so many sources, so it goes in one ear and out the other. Okay, how is the information going to stick if you give them an action step to do? Say you wrote a book, right? And in your book, you talk about taking back your power, right? What is one action that they can take that will give them that power back? And for more information, they can buy your book, right? Of course, but you're going to give them a little tidbit, right? So we want to shift from ourself to the audience. And when we do this, not just in our speech, not just in our stories, not just in our call to action, but in our energy field, right? When we're thinking about self, it's easy to get nervous, right? But if we shift to them, then what's going to happen? We are going to feel free right? We're going to be liberated because we are giving information. Most human beings, it is their very nature to want to help be helpful. If someone has a flat tire, oh, how can I help you? Do you want me to call triple A? Do you want to do, do you want to borrow my phone? What do you need? We want to help. It's in our human nature. So when you shift the energy from you to really thinking, what would their lives be like? If they leave here feeling that their pains and problems have diminished, even if just a little bit, or even if they're feeling more hopeful about the future, right? Okay. So that's the second one. Now we have that out of the way. You are going to take your presentations to the next level. All right. This was one of my worst cases of mistakes that I made over giving content. That's why I only have five pieces of content during this session. If it was the old me, it would have been 10, 20 pieces of content, right? We want to remember that when it comes to speaking, less is more. Think of it as an appetizer plate, not as a buffet smorgasbord, right? We want to leave them loving the information. And if you do my formula of fact, story, call to action, it's very easy. Fact, story, call to action, fact, story, call to action. But we don't want to give them fact, 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 fact. Because when we do that, guess what? They're overwhelmed. Some people do that as a strategy. I was at an AI training today. I teach AI. So I take a lot of, I take AI trainings almost every other day. And the, the facilitator who is a marketer, they were offering the webinar free. Unlike this webinar that I'm doing free because I'm, I, my true intention is to get this information out and to make you and align with your soul's contract. I'm not trying to upsell you anything. In fact, most of you are already my clients. What am I upselling you to, right? Um, anyway, this particular person was upselling to either a VIP where you get the recordings or their advertising agency. So on purpose, they were giving too much information. They were like, oh, I know I'm talking fast and I know this is a lot of information, but if you upgrade for only $27, you'll get the recordings, which was not a bad deal. Uh, and I did buy it, so it did work. But if you're not doing that kind of a presentation where you're giving something free with the purpose of upselling, 
then less is more. Less is more, okay? And the reason for that is as humans, we can only process so much information. There's a certain amount of bytes. Think of our brain like a computer. If you put too much information, too many files on the computer, what happens to the computer? It starts slowing down. It doesn't operate at its full capacity and full speed, right? So you are, you know, operating slower. So the same thing with people in the audience. If you give them too much information and you don't allow them to process it, what happens is they feel like they're, they just tune out. They're not going to get any of it anymore. So what we want to do is, and in marketing, they call this the pink spoon technique. Uh, I used to, my dog wanted to join the webinar. Come on, you can join. Um, I used to be a yogurt girl. Um, when I say I used to be a yogurt girl, my first job was selling yogurt. And I loved that. I was so proud of myself. I would think I was 15 and a half. I got a work permit and my job was to sell yogurt. And when they were doing the training with me on how to sell yogurt, they didn't say, tell people that this was a long time ago, like in the 80s, tell people that a pint of yogurt was $3.99. No, not at all. They didn't say that. What they said was get a pink spoon and offer people free tastes. And I would say, would you like some strawberry yogurt? Would you like some vanilla yogurt? Would you like some chocolate yogurt? And they would be like, oh man, that is some good yummy yogurt. Wow. And then they would buy a couple pints, right? And I'd be selling pints, 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 pints. I wouldn't even sell cups. I would sell pints. Why? Because I was giving them just enough. If I would give them like a whole big spoonful, like a tablespoon, right? What would happen? They would get full and they would leave the store and they would say, thank you. They're full. So the same thing with our audience. We don't want to fill them up so full that they shut down and walk out, right? That it, they just can't handle it anymore. We want to make sure that their information is digestible. How can we make it digestible? In small little pieces, right? So we want to give just enough information. And it's a very different thing to present a webinar like this and to present a speech on a stage. So for a webinar, because I'm delivering a lot of information, I have, you know, bullet points on the slide. If I were going to be doing a speech, I might just have an image and maybe three to four words. Why? Because I'm not going to be reading from the slides. I'm going to be speaking. And to be honest with you, when I speak, keynote speaking, I don't rarely use slides. I find slides to be very distracting. And even when I spoke at Procter & Gamble, the HR person who kind of got to know me and our planning of the conference over nine months, she said, oh, you are the PowerPoint. I'm like, yeah, I don't need a PowerPoint. I am the PowerPoint. I'm going to bring the stories alive so we don't need to have a slide. So just so you know, for those of you, just because I know maybe people like Jade, I don't know, Bonnie, maybe, maybe you too, Megan, will be on bigger stages. And so I'm just seeding that for you. Less is more when it comes to PowerPoints, right? You can have an image and just a couple keywords and that's fine. But the key thing is, especially if you're going to use a PowerPoint presentation and you're speaking, you know what the big challenge of that is? Let me tell you from speaking in front of huge audiences of thousands of people. You're speaking and you're facing the front, but guess what? The PowerPoint is behind you. And so, the, because when I say the PowerPoint is behind you, because when you're speaking on big stages, there's going to be huge TVs, right? Not even TVs, screens, movie screens, right? And the PowerPoint is going to be projected on the screen. Don't get nervous. For those of you that do not want to speak in front of that many people, you don't have to. I'm just saying, 
for those of you that want to. For those of you that don't, it's okay. You can keep it small and have just as much impact, right? Or you could keep it online and have just as much impact, okay? It's all right. But for those of you that want to think about going big, right? You're going to have screens that are on the right side and are on your left side. And you do not want to stand behind the podium. Why? Rule of thumb. And this is for if you're a public speaker or a paid professional speaker, because I coach both people. People that are public speakers, they're speaking for work. They're speaking at association meetings. They have to speak to present, but they're not a keynote speaker per se. People that are paid keynote speakers do not want to get behind the podium. Why? Because it is, is a barrier. It is a huge physical object that's blocking your energy from the audience. And if you want to try it out one day, if you have to do a speaking event, try saying good evening behind the podium, then try saying good evening in front of the podium and listen to the response you get from the audience when you're in front of the podium. Why? Because they feel like you're with them. You're not a sage behind the stage. You are with them helping them learn, helping them grow, okay? So that's just a pro tip. So the reason why I say less is more with the presentation is you can't see the presentation. So if you have a bunch of bullet points that you're reading, that's not what it's for. So I'm doing this because it's a webinar, which is more like teaching the class. I'm giving you bullets. I can refer to it. But if I were to do a speaking engagement, which is different than what this is, to me, this is facilitating teaching training. This isn't speaking to me. Even though my word, my mouth is moving, I am physically speaking, but to me, this isn't a speech. You understand the difference? So in front of an audience, you're orating, right? You are bringing the message alive. Why? Because you did slide one. You got it in your soul. You rehearsed it out loud. You rehearsed it with a video to see different body language. You rehearsed it with a small audience of your Toastmaster friendly, uh, supportive people to give you positive feedback and improvement. Let me tell you, Toastmasters, the nonprofit organization, will never judge you. They're there to support you and help you learn, and they will give you feedback that's only constructive. So never be nervous about Toastmasters. Okay? Cool. All right. Less is more. Cool. Next, we want to talk about distracting body language. I told you my thing that I was doing and I still can have a tendency to do it would be to play with my hair. See, my hair is back. <laughs> I was notorious for that. Another thing that you see people do is they'll hold on to the podium or some people, and they don't even know that they're doing it. I love this podium, by the way, because it's clear. You see the podium in my AI picture? It's clear, but you notice the speaker is not behind the podium. All right. She's to the side of it and you can be in front of it. OK. In fact, if you want to have an extra pro tip to really own the stage, you don't want to just be in front of the podium, but you want to be to the right of the podium at certain moments and to the left at other moments. Why? Because you want to talk to center stage, stage right and stage left. And you can once you become more comfortable on stage and more at ease. You can even, when you're telling one story, be on one side, and when you're moving to your next point, be on the other side. Or I know a lot of salespeople who want to anchor a certain emotion, and when they want you to be motivated to buy, they'll be in one spot, and when they want you to think about your pain points, will be on another spot. That's like deep, subliminal, subconscious, higher level speaking that's not for this class but if you're interested i do teach that because i'm a master nlp practitioner and we learned that it's so awesome it's like the secrets of tony robbins and les browns all rolled into one okay so when you own your stage 
I want you to feel free if you need to, to take a pause. One of the things that happen to most humans, and you are human, right? No AI bots on this chat, just Fred, who's my note taker. But as humans, it is natural to when you take the stage to feel anxiety, to feel nervous. I, to this day, after 22 years of speaking, still feel nerves. Master orator Ludacris says, if you are not nervous, then you just don't care enough. And if you saw him take the stage at the Super Bowl, oh my God, he was so good. I saw him recently open up for Janet Jackson. He can flow, all right? He is in the zone. He can flow, right? So if you need to take a moment to pause and just regroup, feel free. It's going to feel like a long time, but even if you took five seconds, it's plenty of time. In fact, it kind of gives anticipation for what you're about to say. It doesn't work against you. It works for you. Depending on how far you have to walk to get to the stage, A, it'll let you catch your breath. I've had to walk very, very far sometimes to get, depending on the rooms that I was in, um, or other times I'd be wearing very, very high heels. I'll never forget, I had this presentation I did and it was with um, Eva Longoria, and she had just been partying with Obama because she had helped campaign for Obama and he won. And so she she was very, very slow that day. <laughs> She was on already. And so I had to kind of fill in. And I remember trying to walk to the stage and her bodyguards are like trying not to let me on stage. So I was flustered. So instead of speaking when I was flustered, I owned the stage. I owned my power and I paused. And then I spoke, right? So this is your stage. You control it and you control the audience with your voice, with your words with your emotion, with your pauses, with your silence, with your tone, with your pitch, with your tempo, how fast you're talking. There's so many different ways that you can own the stage, but it is your stage. And during your time, you are there to inform, inspire, persuade, influence, whatever your intention is, or whatever the purpose of your presentation is. Own that, okay? So you don't have to feel that anything else matters. And one of the things that I have been known to do, or my actually my public speaking coach taught me, don't trust a speaker without a coach. Don't trust anybody without a coach. I think everybody should have a coach. There are people that have come before us that have learned these lessons. Why not learn from them? So my public speaking coach, she's still my coach to this day. She was the first one that got me my higher paid gig in the thousands of dollars. And she now gets, I think, 25,000. She's listed on Speaker Bureau per gig. She's so awesome. And she told me she literally put tape on the ground on the stage because she said I was stuck in one position and I wasn't owning my stage so she put tape on the floor and she says I want you to speak here and here and she also told me focus on one person in the audience that's smiling that smiling person that person that's looking at you and shaking their head that person, when you do the call and response, that is like, yeah, right? So instead of the guy, TJ, even though TJ did love me, did I tell you TJ, not only did he come up to me after and say that he loved it, but he hired me for coaching. That's why I still know his name from Little Rock, Arkansas, right? But you look at that person that's smiling. And if you're online, like we are right now, you imagine that one person that's like, Oh, this is good, right? You don't want to get distracted by distractions because while you're speaking, things are going to happen. I've had earthquakes, <laughs> fire drills. I've had people walking in the room with ladders. I've had disruptions, phone going off. Let me give you a funny pro hack. 
if you ever have a phone that goes off during your presentation, it doesn't really happen anymore because the MCs do a good job of either, either taking phones or really instructing people to have them on off. If the phone rings, then you can work it into your speech and says, that reminds me that you're getting a call to go deeper. You can just like use that word or, you know, does, is this ringing a bell? <laughs> you could say to people when the phone goes off, does this ring a bell what I'm talking about? And they'll be like, oh, wow, she's good. He's good, right? Okay, so you, it's, and I learned this in NLP training, you use whatever happens to your benefit, okay? All right, okay. So you're gonna own your stage and it's gonna help that you video recorded yourself so you can see how you look. It's gonna help that you went to Toastmasters or you got feedback from a person or a coach, it's gonna help that you've actually, I highly recommend, I always do this, make sure, especially if you're traveling out of state in these times of global warming, that you arrive the day before. It worked, I've never missed a speech except once. It was in Savannah, Georgia, and it was this unexpected, horrible hurricane. And I did plan on coming the night before. However, because of weather, I ended up sleeping on the floor in Memphis, listening to Elvis play at the airport over and over again. And in fact, by the time I did get to Savannah, just in the nick of time, the college closed down for safety purposes. It wasn't my fault. But we always want to get to the venue, wherever we're speaking, as early as possible. Why? We want to get the lighting. We want to get the sound check. We want to look at the stage. We want to get comfortable with the stage and the equipment, right? So if it's something that's simple, you can do it an hour or so before. If it's something that's a major conference, you can do it the day before, right? So that you're really comfortable. Can I give you another hack? This is a pro tip hack. I'm giving you a lot of pro tip hacks, which aren't in the regular presentation, just because I know who's here and I know who's coming to watch the replay. And some of you are next level pro speakers. So I wanna give you a pro tip. You know what I do that totally helps get rid of nervousness and results in future paid speaking engagements? I arrive early and often will attend another workshop of another speaker just to get the tone of the event to see how the other speaker is speaking to see how the audience reacts and then I go to whatever break they go to and I meet people and I, I don't introduce myself hi I'm the keynote speaker that's ego not your amigo what I do is I say hi I'm Deborah and then I say what's your name oh what do you do Oh, what brought you to this conference? And I just start meeting people and asking them questions. Why? Because going back to the beginning, I want to know their pains and problems. And I want to make sure that I'm touching on them when I speak. Okay. So then they feel like I really know and understand. And more importantly, that you care, that you care about them. People don't care how much expertise you have if you do not show that you care about them, right? So showing that you care about them is a game changer. So then what happens is I go on stage, this was recently in San Diego at the US Swim Association. Oh my God, it was so awesome. And when I was at the US Swim Association, I was able to give a shout out to my swim coaches in the back room from Florida, right? And I was like, hey, and guess what? When I got on stage, I didn't feel as nervous that I was talking to strangers. Why? Because I had met so many people in the room. They had become my friends, right? Cool. All right. So body language, we will be mindful of it. We will own our stage. We'll take some of these pro tips. By the way, if these pro tips are irrelevant to you, leave them. Take what you like. Leave the rest, okay? All right. One more tip. And then I am going to stop and take 
questions because I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions and we should be wrapped up within 20 minutes. How do I know? Because I am watching the time. Even though I have been speaking for so long and doing so much online training during the pandemic, I would do two two hour webinars in one day. I was literally nonstop speaking. So in my body, in my mind, in my soul, I kind of have the pacing of things. Sometimes you just get carried away, don't we? Don't we all get carried away with time? And I have to tell you, when it comes to public speaking, one of the most important things that I learned from my Toastmasters club, and by the way, I was part of one Toastmaster group for three years, another group for five years, and I was a president of a couple chapters, right? And the number one thing that Toastmaster drilled into us was the importance of starting and beginning on time and being mindful of the pacing of our speech. Time is so important. Why? Because time is valuable and people value their time, right? So at Toastmasters, what they would do is they would have cards and they would give you a green card when you had like five minutes. So I have a timer that's set. Uh, you get a yellow card when it's about to wrap up and a green card when you're out of time. When you're doing professional speaking, public speaking, speaking up at a meeting, you're not going to have the luxury of that. So you're going to have to have your own cues. Internal cues are okay, but I have to tell you, most people get a little nervous when they're doing a speech for the first time. It's natural, like Ludacris said, it's natural to get nerves. And inevitably, guess what's going to happen? your time is going to get cut. I would say my professional paid speaking life where I'm hired and flown all over the country to do a speech, most of those are cut. Like they'll tell me, okay, 45 minutes. And then, okay, no, we only have 20 minutes. So I have to know my speech. Fact, story, call to action. That's my formula that I like to use with my organization of my speeches. Yours could be totally different. And I have different templates and different formulas um, that I could share with you at a later time. Not in this speech, not in this presentation. But when you know the organization of your speech, when something gets cut, it's okay, right? You can deal with it. I, I was speaking the other day and we've had so many earthquakes here in Los Angeles where I am. And literally in the middle of my speech, an Amber alert goes off on my phone. Ah! And I thought it was another earthquake. I'm ready to duck, <laughs> but it wasn't. It was like a missing person or something like that. But, you know, time can easily get away from you. So what is the solution? We're going back again. To rehearsing out loud. One of the things that I recommend doing is taking your presentation and dividing it into segments. I used to do this when I would run marathons. I used to run, I did five marathons. Marathons, 26.2 miles. If you've ever walked one mile, two mile, three miles, five miles, seven miles, it's long, right? Imagine 26 miles. You don't want to imagine that. So what you do as a hack is you imagine, okay, I'm just going to do a 5K. That's 3.1. Okay, now I'm just going to do a 10K. That's 6.2. Okay, now I'm just going to do a half. That's 13.1. Okay, now I'm just going to get to the breaking point, which is 18. Okay, now I'm just going to get to 20. Now I'm just going to get around the block. Now I'm just going to get to the guy in the red shirt. Now, you know, and you break it down into segments. Okay. If you're thinking about the whole speech all at once, your brain can get overloaded. But if you focus intro, conclusion, then point one, two, three. And when I'm saying, when you rehearse, why would I say practice the introduction and the conclusion? 
why wouldn't I say go intro, point one, point two, point three, conclusion, just like I'm presenting now. The reason I say that is because the most important thing to rehearse out loud is the beginning and the end. Why? The beginning is going to captivate them, draw them in, and keep them. The conclusion is going to knock their socks off. It's going to make you memorable because you move them. And that's what you want to leave them with. The middle, you know, you definitely want it to be good. That's the content. That's the meat. But you got to wow them at the intro and wow them in the conclusion, okay? Very important that that is polished, spot on. Because even if they cut you off and you can't get to point three, at least you know you've drawn them in, you've left them with a bang, and point one fact, story, call to action, you got it. You got it down, okay? So rehearse and time your rehearsals. You wanna hear something funny? I would rehearse <laughs> at, well, first I started rehearsing when I'd go on walks. Before I had a dog, I would just pretend like I was talking on the phone. I'd have my phone in my hand and the headset and I'd just be talking and I would be giving my speeches. Then I said, wait a minute, maybe I can just use Zoom and just talk into Zoom, but that just wasn't good to get it in my soul because it was kind of cheating, right? I wasn't really orating, I was speaking. It was a different energy. So then I started practicing out loud, like uh, in the jacuzzi. <laughs> I'm practicing out loud. And one time, it was the night before a speech. It was for, I remember, um, Bright Field Credit Union in Broward County, Florida, because I love Florida, uh, Ho Hollywood, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Miami. It was a credit union. I was speaking. And I gave my whole presentation. It was like a two-hour one in the pool. And somebody in the pool was like, <laughs> I didn't think anybody was listening. But I gave it. And I gave it full out, like, bam. But I did it in segments. So I was able to time. I'm like, oh, wow. Point two is 14 minutes. I need to cut this down. I need to get it to 11. And so then I would be like, okay, my introduction is a nice five minutes. Okay, my conclusion is a nice three minutes. Okay, my points, 14, 12, 11. Okay, maybe I should cut this little. So then I would be able to cut, cut, cut. And if I had to present and they cut me, I would know how to cut because I would be able to cut down an anecdote or a story. Sometimes when you're speaking at huge conferences, if you decide to do that, you don't have to. I'm just seeding this in the back of your mind. One of the things that I used to do um, is I would bring a big digital clock and I would plug it in uh, and it would be on the podium. So when I would walk from stage right to stage left, I would go around and I would be able to see it. They do have many podiums clocks that do a countdown timer, but then you would have to be standing behind the podium to see that. I don't want to. You can also ask the person that invited you to speak or the person that's introducing you to give you a courtesy five minute wrap up. Most people will have no problem doing that. There's nothing, do you see, look, my timer just went off. So my timer is reminding me it's 6.05. You want to make sure you allow 10 minutes for questions. Start wrapping it up. You see, <laughs> right on cue. I love it. Okay. So even though, and people are like, wow, you're so like on it. It's preparation, right? Speaking of preparation, that was the common mistake that people make. They prepare incorrectly by writing it out. Remember, we want to practice visually, auditorily kinesthetically, not just get it in our mind, not just get it in our body, but get it in our soul. So what are we going to do? We're going to practice out loud. Bonus credit if you practice in front of an audience of humans. If you only have dogs, cats, and fish in your house, that's okay. But Toastmasters, great practice, okay? Number two, many new speakers will focus too much on self. It's fine to have stories that are anecdotes that are about you, but bring it back to them. And using you and we language helps with that. One of the pro tips I gave you 
was having a pre-event questionnaire so you know your audience. The more you know your audience, the more you know the pain and problem that you solve for them. Three, remember the pink spoon technique. We don't want to overwhelm them with the smorgasbord of food so that they're so full they can't take more information. We want them to leave informed, inspired, and transformed. How are we going to do that? Give them just enough to be a little bit hungry. You ever go to a trainer? One of my trainers, nutrition coach said, Deborah, you know why people in Japan are so healthy? Because they're taught to stop eating when 80% full, not when 100% full. You actually, pro tip, want to leave them wanting a little more. Hmm. What else does Megan have to say? What else does Bonnie Jade have to say? Hmm. I want a little more. Why? Because then they want to hire you again. I, oh, this was the best thing. The other night I did a speech at a Camarillo Library. It was not for Camarillo Libraries, for the Women's um, Economic Venture Group. And I got a, three gigs at the Camarillo Library, follow-up gigs, from the person listening to me speak. So I was like, ah, so awesome. Leave them wanting more. Be aware of distracting body language. Best way is to record yourself, course correct, and to be mindful of the time. Maybe some of you are very mindful and you don't need a tool like a timer. You don't need a clock and you don't need, you know, a warning. If you don't, cool. But I want to just make you aware. You may not think you need it, but sometimes when we get excited, I don't want to say nervous or anxious because it's just anxiety misdirected. But when we get excited, we get ahead of ourselves and we can actually extend and talk more. All right. I want to share with you before we get questions, some of my successful speakers. This is Audra. This was two weeks ago. So she did her first TEDx talk in Inglewood. And can I tell you, not to brag, but when her video comes out, I'll send it to you. She killed it. I mean, not everybody killed it. A lot, most of the speeches, there were eight speakers, on the, no, five on the TEDx. They were stellar. One person had bad sound. It wasn't their fault. It was the microphone. But again, they were not distracted by distractions. They did not skip a beat. They did not even have their body language flinch, which I don't think I could do. I'm too animated. If if I had bad mic, I'd be like giving evil eyes to the sound. <laughs> but this person was so good. But back to Audra. Audra, my star speaking client, was amazing. She started out singing. She didn't just speak. She orated. She delivered. And I helped her. One of the things that I coached her on, because I do coaching behind the scenes of public speaking, but also the marketing and getting more gigs. So we put, we, we created marketing material. We had this great postcard where they could opt in and get part of her email newsletter and buy her book. She's also an author. Um, she talks about being a burn survivor and that we all have scars. So awesome. I have another client, um, Ang Angelina Rosario. I coached her a while back. It was actually before the pandemic. So her TEDx is out. So I'm going to give you a copy of her presentation of her TED speech. It will inspire you. It will light you up to be on fire. She did so incredible. You could not tell for a second that she had even one bit of nervousness. And her TED Talk to this day has changed my life just from applying the tools for it. And I'm just showing you this because I'm seeding this could be you. Not that you have to do a TED Talk. I have another client that I'm working with. She, she, I actually started working with her doing NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, because when I met her, she was a Pilates teacher, but decided she wanted to change careers. I helped her at the subconscious level to release any fear, any doubt subconsciously, and she became a speaker, trainer, coach. Um, she also does NLP. And also, it was so crazy, I um, officiated her wedding. When she met her husband and she went to Facebook, they had one person in common and it was me I knew her and I knew him and I had the blessing of officiating their wedding I've also officiated 
seven of my other clients' weddings. Not that I'm going to officiate your wedding. <laughs> I'm not saying that. However, could happen. Anyway, Jennifer does not actually speak on stages. I'm sharing her example with you because some of you may not feel that that's the route for you. And that doesn't need to be. You could still be an excellent public speaker without ever getting on a stage. She does online programs and I've done many of them. They're on um, relationships because once she found, she said she went on, I think 400 first dates. And once she learned and mastered the art of relationship and love, she wanted to teach it. So that's what she teaches. And she speaks only online. So you do not have to ever be on stage or in front of an audience. You could do everything from the comfort of your own home and desk, with no shoes on. Like I have no shoes on right now. <laughs> Fun fact. Okay. All right. So um, these are some of the graduates. I used to do a live mastermind group. No longer. I now do everything online. I think Jade is here as part of our program. We have a monetize your magnificence program that is on elevating your public speaking. I have one on marketing your public speaking and one on AI for public speaking. So I'm really excited about that. And news hot off the press. Guess what? Let me tell you. I just had a meeting with Santa Barbara City College, and I'm going to be developing the curriculum for public speaking at the college. And I'm going to be teaching it at um, Santa Barbara City College and UCSB. So as you can tell, my life is dedicated to this. Um, we are starting, this is an invitation to you. We are starting a five week, it's five weeks but it's extended with some breaks in between. Um, elevate your public speaking group. Uh, it's called Monetize Your Magnificence, and this is one of the courses. If you feel called to it, you want to join us. Jade, who is here, is in the group and still here because she knows I have so much content that anything I give is going to be full of material. So if you feel called to and you want to join us, you still can. We are starting up um, the first Wednesday in September. And if you miss a class, we record it. So you're invited. You can go to Monetize Your Magnificence, click Elevate. Uh, but if you do not want to join us, don't feel obligated. There's no pressure. Um, but if you wanted to book a complimentary session with me, this was the Camarillo Library. They had a pay phone, <laughs> so I had to put it in there. I'm like, is this a pay phone? And then I thought I would add some audio. Look, can you? Okay, that's my time. It just says Call Me by Blondie. Those of you that like the song, call me. If you wanted to book a complimentary session with me, you can just to find out more about the different programs. Or if you want to do one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I think Megan's already doing one-on-one -on -one with me. Um, Bonnie is my forever uh, student, and I'm so proud of you. But if you want to go further, you can go to Speak With Confidence now. All right, so I'm going to stop. This is Bonnie. That's a perfect cue for me to stop. And